Hello and welcome to the National Outdoor Pod Show Campsite, where this week we are talking all about climbing. Climbing is the fastest growing outdoor sport in the UK and we have some amazing guests lined up for you, whether you are new to climbing or have been climbing for quite a few years now. Don't forget you can either watch this episode on the Outside and Active YouTube channel or download this episode as an audio version wherever you listen to your podcasts. Please leave a like, comment and review before we tell you what's coming up this week. Is it humanly possible to walk a four-year-old to death? Find out with extreme climber Leo Holding. We both sit down with and head to the stand of Trog Shop for all of your climbing kit needs. Light up all of your climbing adventures as we head to the Nebo stand. In this episode, we also feature the BMC and Blaze Trails who give us some advice on excursions. And finally, Nicola from Mountain Training is here at the end to give us a spot of climbing advice. Now it's time for me to hand over to the wonderful guests of the National Outdoor Pod Show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode three of the National Outdoor Pod Show. And a big thank you to our sponsors, Yonder, who will be giving away the ultimate swim bundle. So follow the link in the show notes to access that offer. But for today, we're here to talk about climbing. Now, climbing is the fastest growing outdoor sport in the UK, but it's actually not something that we're particularly educated on as a panel. However, we do want to have a little bit of a chat before we get into it. And we've got some really cool experts and bits and pieces coming up. So we're going to try and give you a novice's approach to climbing and we're going to ask all the dumb questions mainly because I'm quite dumb. But before we go into that, guys, what sort of climbing have you done or experiences on the mountain? Let's talk about you first, Tanuke. So I've done Via Ferrata, which is basically like beginner's climbing, I suppose. So where did you do that and what does that look like? Yeah, so I did that in Gran Canaria. Okay. And it's essentially sort of little iron steps that they make in the rock face and you sort of clip mm. yourself in and clip yourself off. Oh, it's just like a clip and climb. Yeah, yeah. Nice. yeah. It's a little bit like extreme go ape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was great. Like I climbed things like I would never have been able to sort of see the views that I saw. It was it was like the Grand Canyon. It was gorgeous um, and it was amazing and it was easy and it was doable. It's quite accessible, things like that. And I think that's how a lot of people are bridging into climbing. And you've done a few climbing wars, right? Yeah, I've done a bit of um, indoor climbing. I generally have a little climbing phase about every two years. Nice. Um, (laughs) So we do another one. Um, But I think I do absolutely love, like, running and hiking in the mountains. And it does, like, increasingly appeal to me to try and do a bit. It's just, like, seems like a different way you can see the mountains. So I think I might need to have a more committed climbing phase. I think as as a physical ex- exertion mm. as well, it's like it's really like tough and tiring, and I just I find it a great workout. Mm. My daughter does it; she's ten years old, and she whizzes up climbing walls. She does it every week, and it's insane yeah. how good they are and how fearless they are. And I think for me, I think the bit that I really want to do is take that out onto the mountains mm. and go out into like the wilderness and do it. But speaking of the mountains, have you guys ever had any adventures up on the peaks or anything along those lines? Yeah, well, I, I was living in the Lake District for a year. So um, I think I just, I'm not very good at running in the mountains. I'm not very good at, at ascending or descending. But I just love the that. Two important bits. Yeah. <laughs> just standing Hopelessly still. average. Just the top. <laughs> Hopelessly. I'm not that good at that either. But I just, there's something about being in the mountains. I just, like, it's that feeling of, like, you're in the elements. You've got to look mm. after yourself. It's so unpredictable. Like, I started running just, like, on the roads. And then I thought that, like, the Thames Path was a pretty gnarly trail for a long time. <laughs> and I just think, like, I still feel like such a novice in the mountains. I'm, like, getting more and more into doing, like, mountain ultras. I'm doing the CCC at the end of August. What's um, the CCC? It's in the UTMB series, so it's like the one down from the the big UTMB. What's the UTMB for people who don't know? (laughs) Sorry, talking runner speak. Um, The Ultra Trail Mont Blanc, so it's like the mecca of trail running, really. Um, And the CCC is 100k around the mountains around Chamonix. So excited about that, but yeah. It's going to be beautiful. Yeah, I'm excited, but no climbing involved, but need to get a bit better at going up the hills. And sorry. Tanuke, what about you? Any adventures up in the mountains that you've had? Um... I went, well, no. (laughs) (laughs) I was thinking I went into the Grand Canyon one time, but we're talking about peaks. Um, So no, no, I haven't. I haven't done that yet. I'm thinking about doing those three peaks, um, 24 hour vibes. So I've done the three peaks in 24 hours. And and it's it's actually, it's a really accessible, but still quite tough experience. I mean, you've got to train for it. You can't just show up. 
But actually, to do it in the 24 hours, weather dependent, is, is, is a good challenge. And it's, yeah. it's quite accessible to most people. And I would advise you to, to take it on. But there's other three peaks as well, aren't there, around the country that you can do? You do like the Yorkshire Three Peaks. Yeah, the Yorkshire Three Peaks is a really good day out, actually. Um, it's 24 miles, um, but you can, like, it's really accessible public, public transport. It's, like, it's beautiful up there. And I think we do in the UK, like uh, Scotland, Wales, England, we have so many good mountains. I remember yeah. I was chatting to a girl in like a mountain refuge in New Zealand and she was saying that she come she was from the UK and she was like I've done loads of hiking over here but I'd never do something like this at home and I was like we've got amazing mountains yeah. like in the UK and the weather's no less predictable than in um yeah, New Zealand. And, think, and again I think that's one of the things that I would say particularly Scotland where you've got you've got loads of things up there in Scotland that you can climb that are really at a good height so yeah, yeah I, I think there's plenty of adventure that you can find across the UK as you can see we are absolute experts in climbing <laughs> however we are going to do our best to introduce this section of the episode and talk you through it and give you a beginner's view it is a it is a sport that's growing really quickly in the UK and what we're going to try and do is encourage you to get out there and give it a go so stick with us to the end of the episode because Tanuki has got a would you rather that we're going to finish off with so we will come back to <laughs> on that but in the interim it just leaves me to say a big thank you to our sponsors yonder who are giving away the ultimate swim bundle so follow the notes in the show notes you know the drill by now on to the next interview you'll be able to relate to this interview with leo holding if you too have also found yourself hurtling towards a crevasse in the ice with a 200 kg weight strapped to you for this episode's main interview, I'm speaking with Leo Holding, who is one of the world's best adventure climbers. So, Leo, before we start, what is an adventure climber? Well, climbing is a really booming uh, sport at the moment, and it's it's a really very diverse, broad church. You know, at one end of the spectrum, you've kind of got indoor bouldering, which is probably the most popular type yep. of climbing these days. You know, it's very accessible if you live My in the city. My kids do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, it, there's limited risk. You don't need much equipment. Uh, and then at the other end of the spectrum, you've kind of got, well, you could say you've got mountaineering and climbing Everest yeah. but you know most people realize mountaineering is kind of separate to rock climbing uh, but even within rock climbing you've got sport climbing where you're climbing outside uh, mm. but generally not more than 20 30 meters up yeah. and the bolts are drilled into the cliff so it's really safe um, adventure climbing is right at the other end and, and what I specialize in is, is like giant adventures in a vertical context so you're climbing cliffs that can literally be multiple kilometers high that can take what? weeks or even months um, to climb, there's no kind of infrastructure on the mountain, so you've got to bring all your own stuff with you. Uh, and it's basically really sort of hairy bottomed adventure stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so you bring your own stuff and you just you just go, right, I'm going to the top of that. You make your way. So that feels pretty dangerous. There is obviously an element of risk involved in, in all forms of climbing. I mean, even indoor bouldering, yep. you know, you can easily break your arm or your leg. Um, but sort of risk management is is the key to, to dangerous mm. games. Um, so. You know, a lot of the skill of, of climbing and particularly adventure climbing is is mitigating the risk. You know, you're not going to remove it, but and also that's what makes it so exciting. If it wasn't yeah. so dangerous, it wouldn't be we'll so exciting. Best, yeah. um, but with all the specialist equipment and specialist skills and training, you kind of figure out how you can you know offset a lot of the risk because you basically would just die if you tried to do <laughs> some of the things that I did without the right gear and the right knowledge. Yeah. Um, but you can bring it to that. You know, we talk about the the fine line, that fine mm. invisible line between between bravery and stupidity, between badass and dumbass. Yeah. And um, and the closer you can get to that line, the more rewarding and exciting the adventure is. But if you step over that line, it doesn't go well. I feel like I live most of my life on the other side of that line. But <laughs> it's, it's interesting. So for people, look. So that's where you have the competence versus confidence. Right? Yeah. You have to find that balance between zero competence, 100% <laughs> confidence. <Yeah. laughs> so for people, like, obviously, you are so well respected in the climbing community, and people in the climbing community will know exactly who you are. But for some of our audience who perhaps haven't heard of you, what would be the three biggest, craziest things that you would be most well renowned for? Um, so my background was very much rock climbing in the UK, and then now I specialise, in a nutshell, climbing the tallest cliffs in the world, yep. um, and in really sort of hard to get to places. So I would say the things I'm most proud of when I look back, um, there's a mountain in Antarctica, which is called uh, the Spectre, which is a big pointy chunk of granite that's half a mile high, uh, and it's probably the hardest place in the world to get to. That trip, we we kite skied, so you know it's like kite surfing with skis yeah, and yeah. a giant sledge for two thousand miles um, <laughs> across Antarctica. Just three. How long did that take? It took us two and a half months. Um, oh we had food for ninety days. We had food for eighty-five days, but we finished. You never quite know when you're traveling with the wind. Um, but like so that's wait, what I like to so call. You had, you had food for 90, how many days did it take? 
We finished it in 67 days in the end. Um, so we were like two weeks ahead of schedule. But if, if the wind had gone the other way... Well, you tried to, do, you know, you tried to start the odds in your favour. The, the Antarctic season is basically three months, so you've got to do it in three months. Um, but I like to think of that as very kind of... I call it new school exploration, 21st century exploration. Yep. 20th century exploration is what you think of as exploration, right? You mm. know, the big beers. I mean, I've got one of those now, but <laughs> the, uh, you know, the classic, the golden era, the Scott and Shackleton yeah, yeah, yeah. and Mallory and Irving and, and, and Tenzing and, uh, and Hillary. And, uh, and, you know, going to the South Pole, climbing Everest, that was the cutting edge of mm. adventure and exploration 100 years ago. Yep. It really isn't anymore. I mean, it, 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 it is a form of extreme tourism. The new exploration, the new cutting edge of of adventure it is a little bit more creative so yep. sports like kite skiing wingsuit flying big wall climbing um so i've been a proponent of taking these really kind of new school things that you would normally practice in the alps places where there's a rescue service where you're not that far away where they're easy access taking those really quite extreme games to to a full-scale expedition environment you know where you're out for multiple months self-supported but back to your question. So that was called the Spectre Expedition. I mean, that um, I, I could spend. Like, I feel like we're going to be here for days. Yeah. But that sounds like a really cool and amazing experience. What before we move on to the next two because we're going to have to. But <laughs> what is like? What, what was the weirdest, more or scariest moment of that trip? Because that feels pretty gnarly. All right, top three. From, it's called the Spectre Expedition. You can find yeah. it online. Uh, and again, you know, we didn't go to the South Pole. We didn't cross the whole of Antarctica. It's a real hard sell to do an, an expedition like this, which is so progressive. But we climbed this big pointy mountain, which is incredible looking thing, super hard to get to. The hairiest moment was when I was kiting along down a place called the Scott Glacier, named after Captain Scott. Uh, and my sledge, my, it's called Pulk, that weighs 200 kilos, fell down a crevasse. Uh, and I started getting pulled back no. into the crevasse, which is kind of like the worst thing that could possibly happen. What, what do you do? Well, it's called the tray. The rope that ties you to the sledge is really surprisingly long when you're kiting. Mm. It's like 15 meters long. Oh, okay, um, so you've got time. It, well, you haven't because it's 200 kilos. You know, it, it, it was like a wily e. coyote, you know. <laughs> Um, but we put knots in that rope in the trace yeah. for exactly that situation, and it worked. One of the knots bit into the edge of the crevasse and wedged and, and took the weight of the sledge, and I stopped. Do you have to cut it and let it go? Mm -hmm. No, um, you try not to because it's got all, all your, your food stuff, yeah. and all your sleeping yeah. gear and all your survival equipment. Um, so, no, I put an ice screw in, um, yeah. uh, clipped into it, managed to get out of the system, and then we had to go down into the crevasse and... And get the sledge out, oh which was in God. operation. It sounds like a horror movie. Well, as I said <laughs> in the film, it's I uh, uh, didn't lose the pulk, didn't break. Yeah. Um, I didn't lose any of my kit, and I and I didn't die. Result. <laughs> 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 but then the most surreal thing there was two things. One, we saw a bird at eighty-seven degrees south. So the South Pole is ninety degrees south, right? The very bottom. What of type the, of bird? It was a it was a um, a southern polar skua. But it was 500 miles away from the ocean. And the first time I saw it first, and my mates thought I was tripping. Like, they genuinely yeah. thought I was losing it. Which I imagine you do I, in I that. Saw, yeah. Well, you know, you, can't, people, you, you do start to hallucinate yeah. when you get absolutely exhausted. But I was like, mm. no, mate, I'm fine, honestly. And I saw a bird, and they, they genuinely didn't believe me because it had buggered off. Um, and then the next day it came back, and there was a, it's like a massive seagull. But, you know, like way out there in Scott, the Antarctic Territory, on the Antarctic Plateau, like, what are you doing here? And I'm sure he was thinking, yeah, what, what are you doing here? I can fly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <You guys. laughs> and then uh, and then right towards the end of the trip, we had the most amazing. We, we got becalmed so that we lost the wind. And um, so you can walk, but on a, on a good day of walking or skiing, you know, you walk mm. on skis, dragging your sledge, you're going to do about 20 miles and you're going to break your balls to do that. And you're mm. going to use loads of energy and it's really tiring. On a good day of kiting, you do 200 miles. Um, cool. And it's really good fun, and it's yeah. really exciting. Uh, and you don't use that much energy because the wind's doing all the work. Yeah. So when you've got no wind, you're like, well, shall we just shall we bust our balls and try and do 100 miles in the next week of like really hard effort? Or shall we just rest and eat some food and r relax and wait for the wind uh, and then do 100 miles in a day? And we, we opted to wait because we're lazy. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but we waited for five days. And after like... Just having a random, like, oh, God. random picnic in the Arctic. Yeah, yeah. And it was right after uh, New Year's because the Antarctic summer is yeah. the opposite to, yeah. to the Northern Hemisphere, right? So you, you tend to go there over Christmas and New yeah. Year's. Um, but after like five days, we're starting to think, oh, no, we are actually like running out mm -hmm. of time now. We, we have to get out of here by the end of January. And... Uh, 
Um, and then uh, and then we had this amazing thing. It, it, it's a it's a similar phenomenon to a rainbow, um, but it, it's called a pa- a, po- a a parhelion, a solar parhelion. But we had like the ultimate parhelion, which is where you get all these circular like rainbows around the sun and around the sky. I mean, I really did think I was tripping that time because it's 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 un it's unbelievable. It's like a, do you know what a sun dog is? Where you get yeah yeah yeah. yeah so it, it's kind of like that, but there was all these different phenomena happening at the same time. So there was two complete circle circular rainbows around the sun. Uh, and That's then another so one, it's called a 42 degree, a 45, de- 42.5 degree rainbow. I, I found all this out afterwards. <laughs> I was going to say, was just like, you're very educated on this. Are you yeah, looking well, at we it? read up on it because it was yeah. the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And then there was another one which goes around on the other axis. So it's going like around the whole sky. And then these light bending, th- it was, Sounds I mean, amazing. It, was, it was utterly unbelievable. I'll show you a picture. It, yeah. it was like the most amazing God moment ever. And right after that happened, the wind came, started picking up. Uh, and we've been sat there for nearly a week getting stressed. Then we had this otherworldly parhelion Some, experience. Something out there. And then we yeah. did we did the next five days we did nine hundred kilometers of kiting. We did like nearly half the trip. It, the conditions were perfect, the snow surface was perfect, and we managed to kite out and uh, and it was you know, you've got to be in it to win it, but w- w- you know, the first good day of kiting we had on that trip was day forty two. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, it was it was a brutal trip. Um, so this is all before you even get there. I mean, this is actually on the way back. So it was like the, yeah, the, the okay. climb was in the middle. So we right. kited in, climbed it, and went out. Um, but then you know, I think we might have to do two, otherwise we'll be here all night. But um, <laughs> so then the other the other kind of uh, avenue to my life these days, I was, I'm, my kids are actually exactly the same, same age as yours, Mike. I've got a young family, a ten year old and a seven year old, and my wife, who's a is a GP. Is also a, a climber and, and into adventure, and we've been doing increasingly sort of ambitious trips with the kids. And uh, what are we uh, talking about? I mean, are you, you're not taking them out into the Arctic or the Antarctic. Well, basically, <laughs> not quite because the Antarctic is really expensive. But I actually just a couple of weeks ago, I took them on their first polar training trip to Arctic Norway, uh, and we went out in minus twenty three degree blizzard. For three days, um, I actually kited them out in the sledge and put them in the sledge. So hang on, hang on, my hang wife. On. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you said this earlier. You've taken away from like putting yourself in danger to you know trying trying to put the kids in danger. <laughs> Part two of Leo's interview is coming up in a little while, but for now, we're going to chat to the team at Trog Shop. Hi there, guys. My name is Tanuke, and welcome to the kit section of this pod show. Today, I'm speaking to Joe about from the Trog Shop about all things climbing. So, yeah, Indeed. fill me in about who you guys are and what you guys do. So, Trog Shop, we're an independent retailer and also UK distributors for a company called Kong in Italy. At the forefront of rescue equipment, but also do a large range of sporting equipment for caving climbing and canyoning so climbing obviously a massive massive part of the outdoors you know experience most yeah. of the people we've been speaking to today at the show they're like yeah i do climbing i do climbing yeah, I do climbing. Yeah. so being showing them some new equipment that's available obviously talking to some people that are getting into the sport about what equipment they need as well mm. so it's been really exciting today to meet those people yeah what, what kind of advice do you have for new climbers and what kind of kit do you have for get out there yeah. talk to your friends if your friends do it get involved get out enjoy the outdoors especially when the summer's just around the corner yeah. Get out there you know enjoy it like the mountains are there the crags are there the peaks are there like make the most of it it's 100% worth it and you don't have to spend an absolute fortune to get into Mm. doing these things quite often people will lend you kit to start with and then you can build up from there it can cost you thousands but it doesn't have to (laughs) to start with you know you can start at the base and if you're really Mm. enthusiastic about it then you can start spending the money and truly enjoying what you do and yeah. get out and experience fantastic places in the UK that has to offer. Yeah, it's a beautiful way to see everything it when is. you're climbing. It's like a completely different perspective on everything. It certainly is. I mean, you get up to the top of a crag, I mean, especially when you're doing multi-pitch, uh, mm. so they tend to be the larger pitches that we're doing. The views at the top are just second yeah, to none. Yeah, breathtaking. And you, no one else can see that other than those people that have got that climbing harness on, that climbing yeah. gear. And, yeah, it's, it's a, an amazing experience. You see some beautiful parts of the country. Mm-hmm. And the UK, Scotland, Wales, England, you know, amazing, amazing places. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look, Peak District, we're based in Sheffield. Yeah. 
So we've beautiful. Peak, Peak District right on our doorstep. There's some amazing world-class climbing there. But you travel a little bit further to Scotland, ice climbing and stuff like that, and it's just phenomenal. Exciting stuff. Yeah. And what was it you said about canyoning and mm. caving as well? What's, yeah. what's that all Yeah, about? so canyoning's massively up and coming in the UK at the moment. It's been around in the Europe for a good number of years mm -hmm. now, but it's massively, massively up and coming. Uh, so it's a little bit like, I think, gorge walking but with ropes nice. abseiling. So you're going down, you're not going up. Yeah. Um, so it could be 30, 40 meter abseils. We're heading up to Switzerland later this year with a group of nine of us. And there'll be waterfall pitches of 100 meter abseils there. <gasps> so big, big stuff. Big loads of water coming over the edge. Absolutely beautiful parts of the country. Again, I mean, Scotland is absolutely full of beautiful, beautiful canyons. There's not a lot of it in the UK at the moment. It's mass, you know, it, it, up and coming, like I say. And so I think for people to have a look out for that sport, see how they can get involved with it, potentially learn with training and stuff like that would be amazing. And do you guys do things with the truck shop? Sort yes, of like yes, events so we, and things yeah, like that? Yeah, we can run events as well. We don't run it as a full-time business mm -hmm. where we take groups and have fixed weekends like some outdoors companies do. We tend to have people say, look, there's a group of four of us that want to experience caving. Mm -hmm. We're based in this location. What can you do for us? And then we'll bespoke make those packages for those people. Brilliant. And what about sort of like new... Uh, kit that you have on the market at the moment or is so, there something here at the expo so here at the expo we're launching the new lario range of climbing equipment by kong in italy that launches next month so we've got that on display on our stand here so it's the first that anyone would have seen in the uk at the moment over there so it's new climbing harnesses via ferrata kits helmets mm -hmm. uh quick draws other bits and pieces like that as well so it's pretty exciting uh, there's a lot of activity on the stand with people sort of wanting to see the new equipment and what might be available hi guys uh, i'm here at the national outdoor Expo with Joe from Trog Shop. So, first things first, can we talk headlamps? Have you got any headlamps? Of we course, yeah, we've at? got our own brand of uh, headlamps by a company called Geo, so that's ourselves. We make a range of climbing carabiners as well. So, dual features on the front we've got a spot and we've got a flood. So, we've got on the flood mode, we've got a low, medium, and a high mode. So, if we're in caving, particularly in dark environments like caves, medium mode, so you're not blinding everyone, yep. but you've still got ample light. Turbo mode in the spot, you're lighting up big chambers up to sort of 100 meters, 200 meters, something like that. So really, really good. Rechargeable batteries and charging point on the back as well. So you oh, could nice. remove the battery out the end if there's multiple batteries to charge or charge in the back. Fully waterproof as well. Alloy, alloy shell, so really, really hard wearing. What sort of lumen on these? About 1,400 on those oh, on wow. maximum. So massive output on those, yeah. And battery life on these? Battery life, if you've got a medium flood mode, about... 12 hours off the top of my head. Oh, so good. Yeah, so it's still pretty good. An 18650 battery in there, reflective on the side here with the logo, and you've got a removable headband there. So if you've got it on a helmet and you don't yeah. want the overhead band, you can take that off as well. And is this a specialist climbing light, or could you use Not it? Not at all. You could use it for hiking, caving, climbing, kayakers use it for nighttime, etc. So yeah, really versatile. And that's a geo, so if people that's want to find that, they can go to Trog Shop. They can go to Trog Shop on our website. They've got them available on there as well. Yeah. Amazing. Right, we're going to move to harnesses. Of course. Okay, could you talk me through a couple of harnesses? and some of the basic safety features. So real basic initial harness, if you're kind of looking to get into climbing that side of things, don't want to spend a fortune, umming and ahhing, something like this by Kong in Italy is a really fantastic harness. It's called the Indiana. They come in at about 39.99 with us at Trog Shop here. So a real bargain, two adjustable leg loops here and one on your waist one universal size for everybody so really really versatile and the benefit here we've got a red loop here for yep. your right leg so you can always put oh, it on the right so way handy. <laughs> so people that are getting used to it or yep. younger people in particular red for right black for left and then the rest goes on main attachment point in nice bold yellow on the yep. front so you can't go wrong with that as well so safety is obviously paramount when we're climbing so at the end of the day you can't really go wrong with those That's a warning signals there. Brilliant yeah. star harness, yeah. I love that. Okay, what else you got to show? So, um, s totally opposite end of the scale, canyoning harness. So, multiple gear loops here for all of the equipment you're going to need to hang. You've got a bum pad here, yeah. which is protecting your wetsuit. And so it's waterproof. And stuff. Yeah, when you're sliding down rocks, you're not going to be wearing out your wetsuit like yeah. this. Nice big wide strap on the back, so when you're sitting back on the rope, you're going to be nice and comfortable yeah. as well double attachment point on the front here nice. so that you can adjust both sides and on your legs. These look really sturdy as yeah, well. Yeah, really, stuff. really sturdy. And I mean, 
for me, the colours, the blue and the red just pops as well. I think it yeah. looks really nice. I like it. And what's yeah. the price point on this one? Uh, about 150 on those ones. That's yeah. amazing. So obviously a little bit different in price, about 100 pounds and different, but you can see where you you're can getting see that. Where your yeah, going. of course you can. Definitely. And the price point on the headlamp, I don't think. Uh, price point on the headlight, 59.99. Amazing. This has been awesome, Joe. You've been no a legend. At all. There's nothing I'd fear more than being stuck in a cave without a light. So make sure you don't end up in that situation as we chat to Nebo about their lighting tech. Hi guys, I'm here with Tom from Nebo and we're here to talk about some lighting things for climbing for our tech section. So Tom, climbers, tech, what are we looking at? So I guess with, with climbers, a lot of them are walking in early or finishing late, so headlamps are probably the, the, the port of call for most, most users. We've got a few with us this weekend, um, starting off with the smallest and lightest one we do here at That's the show. That's tiny. We've got the Micro 500, yep. so it's a super small 500 lumen headlamp. Um, it's USB-C rechargeable as well and you've got a few different modes with yeah. floodlight and spotlight on there as well what's the battery life on there so you've got up to three hours battery life on here it's obviously quite a small unit so it's only yeah. a little battery inside so but it's, it's brilliant a, it's kind of like a backup light that's, that's quite it good, yeah. you know it's spare one in your backpack you know it, it does recharge quickly as well so you're looking at up to about 90 minutes to recharge time as well on really? there. and what do you retail that for so these are retailing at 30 pounds uh, 30 SIP, pounds wow so so good, that's good value for money as well. Definite great backup one. That's a really, really good lamp. Okay, and what else have you got? What's the, what's so, the next one? So um, kind of a bit more powerful and a bit more step up is the Einstein 1000. Okay. Uh, again, this is a USB-C rechargeable flash uh, headlamp with uh, a few different modes. Yeah. Uh, in a turbo mode, you've got a thousand lumens. So, you know, super bright. That's going to be a short burst of light for around 30 seconds. Yep. And then it steps back down to the mode you're in. But if you've got a slightly longer approach into a climb or yep. exit to get back to the car park, you know, that's the kind of light you'd be looking for as well. Brilliant. And battery life on that one? Battery life in low is up to 18 hours. Oh, wow. Um, okay. And high is on three as well. So, you know, you've got plenty of light to, to get you back to where you need to be. And would you use this for other sports as well as climbing? Is this like a multi purpose headlamp? Definitely. I mean, lots of our products trans transcend across most different types of use yeah. um, the you know all of these are great for hiking backpacking you know cycling you know fit on top of a helmet uh, we even sell some of these to builders and uh, you know the trades people as well so they're, they're pretty great, versatile they're great products I mean it's just I'm amazed by how light they are they're really incredible and as you can see we're at the expo at the moment people are coming in and buying them as we're standing <laughs> here doing this so I'd better get off the stand and let them sell some more kit but Thanks so much for letting me join on. No this problem. has been the tech segment. Nice, Mike. On to the next bit. Okay, this next section should give a bit more clarity around what I said at the beginning of walking a four-year-old to death. Don't worry, that doesn't actually happen, but tune in for part two. <laughs> well, you know, uh, the uh, it's trying to find that balance because the stuff that, I, you know, my career, my profession has involved a lot of high-risk uh, yeah. activities. Um, and you can't just, you know, well, you can just completely clean, change careers. Um, mm. When you have a family, but at the same time, it's 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 A, what I love to do, and it's B, how I make my living. Yeah. But clearly you have to temper it. You can't, anyone, your life changes when you have, when you become a parent, and anyone who has children know that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's amazing what children are capable of. Um, well, so I'm, I'm fascinated by this, because I think a lot of people, when they hear about a 10 and a seven year old going out into minus 22, yeah. um, they, they might be, they might think that that's, dangerous or risky or irresponsible it's really not so well it's the first so two <laughs> it, is, it, it is dangerous and it is risky but as i said earlier um you know so much risk and danger in in outdoor activity in high risk games can be mitigated it can be managed yeah. um, the simple the simple stuff when it's really cold you need the right kit yeah. you know and uh, you need the right clothing and you need the right systems and you need to know how to wear it there's which i know um, mm. and and i've and i've got the right kit for the children so they've got all the, the layering that they need bear in mind people live in this environment you know yeah. all over the north of canada the north of norway the north of russia People have babies when it's minus 50. It's, yep. There are systems and processes and equipment that you need to manage it. Um, and it's the same in adventure sports. But the, the one trip I would like to mention is, I think of all the trips I've done, and I've done more than my fair share of like amazing adventure holidays. And uh, one of the best was a couple of years ago when the kids were, my little girl was seven and Jackson was four. And we went into a place in Wyoming in North America called the Wind River Range. Right. Which is right next to Yellowstone National Park. Mm. Um, but the great thing with it, it, it's a wilderness area. And they're like national parks, mm. but they don't have all the regulations and the permitting systems. Um, because if you want to go backcountry camping in an American national park, you know, there's a lot of paperwork. Yeah. Whereas wilderness areas, there's no infrastructure, there's no motorized vehicles, there's no houses, there's no roads. 
Um, oh, so it's proper. It's proper. Wilder, yeah. You know, it's proper wild west. Yeah. But there's also no permitting system, so you you're free to just go off into the wilderness and kind of do what you want as long as you don't leave any trace. Um, and I wanted to do a proper backcountry climbing expedition with the family, uh, and we went for two weeks into this proper That's wild cool. west. Think how much food you need for a family of four, as well as your camping gear, as well as your climbing gear. It's if you know it's what you're 80% doing. It's 80% snacks with my kids. Well, yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, that's key. It's totally key. But um, you're looking at 100 kilos minimum. Yeah. For, um, so in Wyoming, in the Wind River Range, you can rent llamas. <laughs> It's a thing. Okay. Yeah. You go up to the dude's ranch and you rent llamas. And, nice. Uh, and they can carry about 35 kilos each. Um, and so we've got these two llamas, Tiberius and Titan. <laughs> dead easy to look at. I was going to say, what did you name him? But I love no, it. They had the names already. And they're just like, they're like dogs. You know, you just walk them on a lead. Um, they're really tactile and friendly. And, um, and they can carry about the same as me. So we um, so we went off into the into the wild west with these two llamas and two little kids <laughs> for two weeks. I bet your kids uh, love it. It was such an amazing trip, man. And and we climbed like a big pointy mountain in the middle of nowhere. My little boy, he was four. Yeah. He hiked sixty miles in two weeks. One day he did fourteen miles um, and, and three thousand feet of ascent, which I three thousand feet of ascent. I didn't know that a four year old could do. I remember my wife was saying towards the end of the day, and we kind of got a little bit, you know, we needed to get over this pass to a place we could camp. Everyone was tired, and I remember she said, D- do you think you can walk a child to death? <laughs> <laughs> you can with dogs, can't you? you know, like, it's the classic Let's find out. Uh, well, apparently not. <laughs> yeah, well, so far. Yeah. Let's, let's give it time. But, I mean, we do the same with ours, and I, and I kind of think, actually, what I notice, and I don't know if you see the same, is that when we take our kids out and take them up, like so we took ours up the Devil's Staircase, and they, they were perfectly capable of doing it. But, actually... When they came down, they were they were much happier than anything that we'd ever done in an indoor environment. Do you notice that in yours? For sure, you know the. Um, I think it's really good for children to um, to go outside and play and yeah. um, and and to experience the natural world and to get cold and to get dirty yeah. and you know it, it's good for your immune system. You shouldn't stop your kids from eating mud. You know, it's like it's real. Uh, as stay a parent, off, stay off the anti back, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If, you know, I live in a farming community, and yeah. my wife's a doctor, and. Uh, th- like so, it's lambing time right now. This yeah. is the only time of year you ever see doctors, uh, you ever see farmers in a doctor's surgery, um, because they have to stay up all night lambing. So they come in to get some antibiotics <laughs> to, <laughs> cause they, to prophylactically, yeah. um, because they never get ill because they they they're out in the mud all yeah. the time and they they Build live their hard immune outdoor lives. Mm. Um, so yeah, and I think for children's development, it's really important. It's increasingly difficult when you live in a city and. It's like an instinctual thing that we don't want to put our children in harm's way. But yes. ironically, by never putting them in harm's way, you, you, you're not doing them any favours. You, you, mm. you know, you really are not building any resilience. And then you, I am a firm believer that a lot of uh, the mental health and anxiety issues that we're experiencing in society right now are partly based on how physically safe and sanitised society has become, how... You know, and it makes sense. Yeah, you know, I travel a lot in the developing world, and you don't really want it to be like that. You don't want it to be where, you know, there's there's live electric wires sticking out the yeah. street, and life is really hazardous. But I think we have overcompensated to the point where we've sort of lost touch with with what it is to be a human. I, I totally agree, and I think there's a, there's a balance in how these things work. So, how do you mix that with then sending your kids to n- a normal school? Well, we, you know, so. It, Right now, um, we make the most of our holiday time. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of have a foot in both counts myself. On the one hand, I have this kind of very unusual extreme life. Mm. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I've got a fairly middle class life in rural Lake District. Yeah. Um, and, and you can kind of make it work. You know, you don't have to sort of totally opt in or opt out. Um, that said, we are taking the children out of school for, um, for a year. For a year <laughs> uh, because... Um, because you're just so tied to the to weekends and holidays. Otherwise, you know, and I think that's fascinating though taking them out for you. And I, I it only one like, year. You know, we're yeah. not going to take them out forever and homeschool them. We're just going to. But they're going to learn a lot in that year. And you're taking them to Nepal, right? We're taking them all over the world. We are going to go to Nepal. I'm really keen to to introduce the children to the developing world a mm. little bit. It's it's really eye opening when you see how the majority of humanity live. It, it really isn't yeah. like this in most of the world. And you know, the 66 million people in Britain, that's a small country. Yeah. Um, and when you travel in places like, you know, sub-Saharan Africa or South America or, or Nepal, you, you just see what their version of normal is. Mm. And all of a sudden, you know, taking the kids camping in the snow 
doesn't seem that extreme. Um, and, I, and I think it's really good for children to witness what it's like to, what poverty is. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, you just, you just realise how lucky you are to be born <laughs> into a Western European society. And they're still learning. They're just learning different things. Totally. In different ways. Yeah, and, we, and you know, we'll make sure we, we'll be homeschooling. We've got, we'll, we'll be keeping them on track with, the, well, I'm going to make them, uh, they're going to keep journals. So their, their English yeah. and geography lessons will be a journal documenting yeah. the trip. But we'll be doing maths we'll be doing um reading we'll be, we'll be which will probably be your tough, toughest adventure it yeah, will, yeah i did homeschooling during covid and in you know all, you yeah, <laughs> it was awful wasn't it yeah. God, yeah. you sure you know what you're My yourself keeps reminding me that it's not an adventure it's not just an adventure hall i'm busily scheduling all the adventures and she's like look we're doing two hours a day um she doesn't even want to give them the summer off i was like what <laughs> they always get the summer off no, like, summer no, holidays. no we're going to settle into the you know, two hours a day all the way through, uh, which I, which is a good idea because otherwise it's going to be really hard to switch from summer holiday mode to homeschooling mode. Um, but yeah, and we, we've got all kinds of exciting stuff planned. I think that's brilliant. So one thing I'd like for our audience to learn, and I think there'll be a lot of people who hear your stories and think they sound amazing, but they think they sound quite out of reach. But for people who are interested in climbing, we know it's the fastest growing sport in the outdoor adventure scene. Um how, how would you advise them to get into it? What would be the first steps to take? Well, clearly these days climbing indoors is um, much more accessible and, and easy to get into, especially if you live in a city. Yeah. Um, so that's the first step. And then you can quite literally learn the ropes, um, a, a lead wall. You can learn how to tie the knots. You can learn how to put the harness on. You can learn the basic movements of, of climbing. But I would strongly recommend that uh, you try and get the transition to, to outdoor climbing. Most climbing walls will have um, some kind of course mm -hmm. on offer. Uh, and you probably need to spend, you know, it's, there are quite a lot of skills and there are quite a lot of barriers to entry because you, you need to like, it's not rocket science, but you can't get it wrong. You know, just mm. a simple tying to the rope. It's, it's a very easy thing. You can teach someone how to do it in five minutes. Yeah. You get it wrong, you die. Yeah. Um, so it's really quite simple, but quite high consequence. Uh, but after maybe a dozen times climbing outside, you know what, you've got enough skills to start doing it by yourself. Um, so, you know, get outside and then something that I really, the, the best thing is, is go camping, go climbing and go camping, yeah. go up into the hills and, you, and it doesn't have to be a hard climb. In fact, just go walk into the hills, but f families and camping is, is a good mix unless it rains. That's less <laughs> helpful. Um, but it, it's just a really, it's a really special time to be out. You know, it's like the tents are like dens and yep. you just, it's really connected. We always bring marshmallows, you know, thankfully. Yep. It's, it's an essential piece of the kit on a family trip. Thankfully, I've got these really little ones now. You've got to stick them between digesters. Is that, have you done yeah, that? Yeah, the schmores <laughs> thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, we, but I've just got these tiny ones because, you know, marshmallows are massive. Yeah, and, they take um, up a lot of room. And it's just as good. You just stick a little tiny marshmallow on a stick and the kids are just as happy. Um, Keeps them busy for longer. It, you know, that's just as important as getting to the top of the mountain. It's not... It's not about conquest. It's not about setting records. It, it, it's about experiencing these these really memorable times with with the kids whilst they're still little. I love that. I think that's a great place to finish. Leo, you've been amazing, mate. I think I, I could chat to you for like ten hours, and I think we probably would all like to listen to you more. Um, if people want to follow you, how do they find you on Instagram or yeah, website? Leo underscore Holding is is good, and uh, on Instagram, and yeah, come along for this uh, this world trip. We're going to be sharing it so amazing well we shall look forward to it and hopefully we'll get you back at the national outdoor expo to chat about it when you come back so um, leo thank you very much guys that's this has been the interview and uh on to the next section it's two for one in the excursion section as we welcome the bmc as well as blaze trails to give you a bit of advice hi there everyone and welcome to the excursion section of the pod show i'm all about excursions at the moment and i'm here with marianne from the bmc and katie from blaze trails please fill me in guys who are you and what, what you guys are all about uh hi i'm yeah. marianne so i'm a hill walking uh, ambassador for the british mountaineering council some people know us as representatives of like the climbing community, but we mm -hmm. also represent mountaineers and hill walkers. So whatever point of the hill or mountain or upland area that you like walking, if you're stepping out of the car park, you're part of our family. Love that. Love that. Hi, so I'm Katie. I run Blaze Trails and we are the UK's parent and baby walking community. So we help people all across the UK get outdoors walking when they've had a baby or if they've got toddlers or young children. Um, and we, yeah, we run free walking groups. So we've got over 60 across the country. Um, but we also provide information, tips, inspiration to get people outdoors in that transitional time when yeah. it can feel really hard to know kind of how to get outdoors or to have friends to go with. So, yeah, we're just trying to kind of get more people out in the same way as Marianne. 
yeah. yeah. Where are you guys based as well? What what kind of areas? Is it every, is it everywhere around the UK? Yeah, so the BMC is national, the British mm-hmm. Mountaineering Council, and our head offices, like we're centred in Greater Manchester, mm-hmm. but we've got clubs all around the country, but also you don't even need to be become a member of a local club if you don't want to. You can still be a member of the BMC and link into social walks, events. Um, we've got a whole network of like affiliate clubs as well. So yeah. you can sort of find a group to walk with, uh, click into skills courses from everyone from like your first time rock climbing yeah. or your first experience in the hills and those skills that you might want to learn just to kind of go, okay, well, what do I do? What do I need to take? Where can I go? Yeah. And you might meet someone you want to go with as well and just kind of taking those first steps, how to find someone to take you if you need a guide. Um, so it's all about finding the right information so that you Mm. can think about what adventures you want to do and then how to do it safely and in a fun way um but also potentially meeting someone that you might kind of go oh you're my kind of people like let's do this together it's so important to build a community like that like especially for people who've never been out before or just their literally their first steps into the outdoors just to have someone to go with or to know where to even start is so important yeah for sure and i was definitely i was not um someone who grew up in our family where we were like every weekend we go Mm. to the lake district and climb Mm. wainwright so i was like what's a wainwright i don't know um but I was definitely one of those people where you're like standing in a, a car park in somewhere scenic, yeah. watching other people putting like a rucksack on and like special boots, All just the going gear. that like that looks intriguing. Or, or seeing people like taking footpaths that weren't the main drag to the mm-hmm. like one picture spot where you like everyone's posting on instagram Mm -hmm. you go well like what is happening in all those other hills and how do i get up there and i don't be an idiot and do something wrong Mm. i don't want to get lost i don't want to do something that isn't safe but i literally do not know how to start yeah um and it was actually my brother who bought me a book like an old school book about hill walking love that and i told my friend oh my brother's bought me this book and they were like whoa geek but actually (laughs) it was just the little bit of inspiration that made me go okay hang on a minute i can buy a map and now obviously we've got amazing apps as well if you're going Mm. into mountain areas then you kind of need a backup don't just trust your phone um but just that little bit of inspiration and little bit of encouragement to go yeah, like, you've got this. It's it's cool. Like you don't need to suddenly become an alpinist or yeah, kind of climb yeah. up Ben Nevis in the night in extreme. the winter. It doesn't have to be extreme because mm. even like the most experienced people that you'll talk to, uh, sort of GB athletes or someone who's like walking across Scotland on their own or whatever, they started off small. Yeah, they didn't like just throw themselves into that. They didn't suddenly wake up with all those skills. You learn yeah. it, and sometimes you learn it through making mistakes. Hopefully, not massive mistakes. But, and it's learning from people that you just get chatting to. Mm. Um, and there's some communities on social which are just really amazing, like really generous with their help and support and encouragement. Um, so, yeah, if you haven't found your tribe yet, like keep looking, they're out yeah. there. Oh, amazing. Amazing advice. You must find that for especially your groups as well, like bringing people out of the home and moving yeah. forward. Totally, totally. Like, yeah, I think we've we've got... I mean, we've got over 10,000 members now and nice. everyone's story is really different, yeah. but there are similarities. So we've got lots of people who have been really active and outdoorsy before they had their mm-hmm. kids um, or quite confident. And then you have a baby and understandably, like so much is Everything thrown up changes. into the air. Exactly. Like your confidence can really kind of take a hit. Mm-hmm. And so we've got a lot of people in our community who really want to get outdoors and they know the benefits, um, but they just don't know quite how to do it or how to adapt their lifestyle to then bring a baby on those adventures. Um, and then we also get people who are starting really from kind of no experience at all of being outdoors but they realize that you know in the midst of being at home and everything else they kind of they want to get outside it's a real kind of like a visceral urge Mm, that they get mm. Um, and then they realize they go out for a walk maybe in their local neighborhood and they're like oh my baby sleeps it might be the only nap (laughs) they get and you know the the kind of only moment of peace that that parent may get so they're like right how do I do more of this Um, and so we help people kind of at at all of their sort of different stages um, to get outside in a way that suits them so whether it's outdoors kind of in their local area or going to a country park or whether it's doing some of the more adventurous stuff like as they get more confident Um, and a key bit of it is having people to go with like lots of people Mm. will say I want to do this but I don't know if it's safe to go by myself or I just I don't know where to go and so 
sort of, you know, you talk about community and having people to do it with, like, it's such a big part of what motivates our community is like, well, I've got a friend I can go and meet at this place and they either know the route or, you know, we neither of us know the routes, but we're going to figure it out. We've got our maps and, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think what what's so important is, yeah, whatever whatever background you have, whatever kind of interests you have, is finding people who share some of that and then kind of figure it out together. Cause, yeah. Yeah, it can, otherwise it feels a bit daunting. A bit I think. Yeah, huge. <laughs> I've got I've got two little kids as well, and yeah, yeah. I was really active, hill walking, and what I found that when I had my first baby, um, firstly, sometimes, some days, getting out of the door is like summiting. I'm yeah. telling you, you're like, yeah. yes, we're yeah. in the driveway. <laughs> this is a win. And then you're like, it's three hours later than I thought. And now it's starting to rain. And oh, what do I do? Um, but the other thing is that some of the people that I was like, oh, okay, I could join that walk or I could do that route. And you kind of go, okay, I don't think those people will necessarily be up for mm. after about 30 minutes. If my baby's done a massive poo and I need to stop, get them out of the carrier, yeah. change them, change clothes, need to get a shelter out, like just to keep us all out of the wind. Like, are they going to be up for it or are they going to be standing there going, come on, come on? And you don't want that stress. Mm. Like, that is the one thing that you do not want. And postpartum, it takes a long time for your body to, I don't think my body's actually ever recovered. Yeah. Um, like you walk in a different way you like your speed is different your your balance is different when you're carrying a baby and extra kit all that stuff that actually you really need someone to be like this is cool we are here for this and it's possible Not, we're tolerating this because mm -hmm. we actually want to do this other objective and you're getting in the way yeah no one wants to be that person and you've got to find the people who are like up for that and actually mm -hmm. if they're people who are going oh yeah I can check on your baby on your back or your toddler or if we need to stop and have a break and like spend 47 minutes playing in yeah. a puddle <laughs> then that's fine then that's cool yeah like, and actually this walk which we thought was going to be five kilometers has turned out to be about 350 meters yeah like yeah. just live in the moment be there for it and don't sort of I, I found it a real exercise in letting go of a bit of ego mm. and I didn't even realize that I was that person like faster summit let's do this I'm gonna brag about what I've done and actually I was like oh hang on it turns out that there was a little bit of that yeah and actually you need to just be in the moment even yeah. if it means that you do spend 47 minutes playing yeah in the yeah, like, yeah there I can, there. I can still enough. see the car <laughs> this doesn't yeah. count except it does you've just got to make it Make it work. Yeah, yeah, make it your new reality. Yeah, exactly. I think it's so important what you're both both your companies are doing for like building community because it's the most important thing to know that you have support and to know that what you're doing is possible. The other thing you, is, of course, those little ones, those babies who are connecting to the outdoors, spending time in nature, like absorbing all that yeah. goodness goodness. They're the future, yeah. right? They're the ones who are going to become the ecologist and the countryside rangers. They're the ones who are going to work out how to solve the sewage crisis. They're the ones who are going to be the stewards of our future. Yeah. Um, so we've got to invest in them and yeah. give them opportunities to be outdoors because like, the reason we're all here is because we know we love it. We yeah. know it's so important. So to, to deny them because you've got some other objective, you're like, no, that's not cool. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> Just to round things off, I'd love to know both of your top places and excursions to go. Um, so we really love the Peak District um, mm. because it's really central in the country and there's so much you can do for all kind of skill levels and experience levels. Um, it feels like, yeah, really approachable. It's kind of adventurous, but accessible. Um, and we really love uh, like the Longshore Estate is beautiful. There's like Padley Gorge. So really quickly you can feel like you're in sort of this enchanted woodland with this sort of babbling stream and rocks. And oh, yeah, perfect. really amazing. Yeah. What about you? Uh, OK, number one recommendation. Check out Youth Hostels. They, they kind of, um, they're everywhere and yeah. they're really affordable. And sometimes you meet brilliant people like sitting next to you at breakfast. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is if you want to start getting into, back into hill walking or mountaineering, mm. scrambling journeys, things like mm. that with kids, then the BMC have like loads of resources on their website. Um, there's a series of, of walk films that I um, presented. So like yes. great walks, best walk with a dog, best walk with mini mountaineers. And I chose Cat Bells in the Lake District. Nice. It's a really popular hill and it feels like a mountain. Um, and to get to the start point, you get a boat across a lake. Ooh, so it kind of nice ticks start. a lot of boxes yeah. and you get an amazing view of the Lake District. And your little ones standing on the top of Cat Bells 
are going to be like, whoa, I climbed that. Oh. Um, and and it's, it's really magical. There's lots of other really accessible peaks as well. And I'd say my one piece of recommend, uh, advice is sort of don't bite off more than you can chew. Like leave them wanting more rather than dragging them up some mm. kind of like 25 kilometer epic where they go, God, let's never do that again. Yeah. Actually start off, get back to the car park, have an ice cream and go, okay, that was awesome. What do we do next? Yeah, that's some great advice. I love that. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thank you. So this advice section is really good for those who want to take the step into the world of climbing. Let's find out more with advice from mountain training. So for anyone who's not familiar with mountain training, could you just tell us a bit about what you do as, as an organisation? Uh, yes, so we are the awarding organisation for all of the qualifications in the UK and Ireland. So uh, if you wanted to be a rock climbing instructor or a mountain leader, um, those sorts of qualifications are, are our qualifications. So we, um, we kind of set the standards for each one um, and we approve the providers who actually do the course delivery. Okay, great. So you obviously like cover quite a lot of different elements of the outdoors, but we're here to give people a bit of advice about climbing today. Yeah. So for like, I'm a complete climbing novice. So I've done a bit on walls, but never really been outside. For someone who's kind of like maybe been to the show, see, seen some speakers, looking to get involved in a bit of climbing, like what would your beginner beginner steps be? Um, so there's a few different options. I guess uh, indoors, um, there's something called NICAS, um, which isn't actually one of ours, um, but we work with them a lot, a partner organisation. Uh, it's the National Indoor Climbing Awards Scheme, NICAS. Um, uh, and they, they run a whole set of... Um, uh, badges essentially a little bit like you know your swimming badges yeah. or that sort of thing that you can do uh, it's essentially that but for climbing um but you get so a badge to put on your towel you do absolutely <laughs> get a badge um and what they've actually so that's a really good way of kind of learning the basics um and they've got a, a new thing for young children as well so it's called wild climbers so from age three three to six or seven i think okay. um, and it's really fun it's all kind of animal based um so for young people definitely wild climbers or nicas um and a lot of climbing walls these days have kind of intro sessions for people that are new um if you want to go straight into some outdoor stuff um then we have uh, rock skills courses so our rock skills introduction course um is probably the best place to start mm -hmm. you know you'd kind of learn how to put on a harness how to tie in how to belay and just have some fun time climbing on a rock um and we're actually we've got a competition this weekend to win a course so hopefully somebody will win that over the weekend oh amazing well definitely yeah hope fingers crossed yeah um and like so i don't i don't think i realized that you could go straight to outdoor climbing so Pete, you can kind of skip the the learning on a wall or yeah left absolutely together. yeah because um that's a lot of, and you know before climbing walls existed which i know they've been around quite a long time now but people did start straight away outdoors so yeah absolutely it's just the introduction course rock skills is just a one day course um so yeah you'll get plenty of time to kind of get familiar with how it works and the equipment and stuff and uh, climbing it can seem a bit inaccessible to some people because there's a lot of kit or there can be a lot of kit and just a lot of jargon mm. a lot of new words that don't mean anything to you <laughs> yeah. if you're not a climber um so a rock skills introduction course would be a really good way of kind of oh okay that's what that means this is how it works the state this is how the safety systems work you know it's not about being a massive sort of daredevil and risking your life yeah. every time you go climbing it's about you know understanding how to manage the risks and the hazards so that you can do it safely um, and also a bit of bouldering as well mm -hmm. so um people love bouldering indoors there's also the uk has some amazing outdoor bouldering venues um so you probably on the rock skills intro course you'd likely do a bit of outdoor bouldering as well and that's really accessible and often pretty family friendly as well because you just need a pair of climbing shoes mm -hmm. and then maybe a bouldering mat um you know like a, a small crash pad to put at the bottom um and then off you can go as a whole family okay. and just have a great day out bouldering that is such a good point actually what you just said about obviously people climbing outdoors before there were walls i think i forgot that you just <laughs> i forgot that the, the, the real walls existed before the indoor walls um so in terms of like so for somebody who doesn't know could you just quickly recap like what what's the difference between bouldering and climbing so bouldering is where you don't have any ropes um uh, you just have some kind of crash matting at the bottom indoors it's really quite thick outdoors obviously a lot thinner and you have to bring it yourself um and generally you don't go that high okay. um so in bouldering they they refer to them as problems rather than roots so it's a it's a boulder problem uh, and it sometimes goes straight up for maybe three meters no less probably no more than that sometimes even less but more often than not they might um traverse which is kind of going sideways so you might traverse round a boulder or it might just be about you go around a boulder a little bit and then you have to get up on top of it um but it's a lot lower level yeah um so yeah so the risks really are about if you come off what are you landing on um and how do you manage that um but it can be a really good way of of getting better and improving your technique 
Are there any places kind of around the UK that you'd really recommend somebody go for a first bouldering trip? Ooh, good question. Um, the two places that spring to mind, if I'm allowed to, are the Peak District and Dartmoor. Yeah. Uh, so Dartmoor has some really awesome bouldering um, kind of around the Hay Tour area and Hound Tour. Um, in fact, most of the tours have different boulders mm-hmm. as well as some roped routes. Uh, and then uh, in the Peak District um, at Stanage, there's some bouldering there as well, as well as um, roped routes. Um, so yeah we are there and north wales i should really give a shout out to north (laughs) wales given that's where i live there's some world-class bouldering in north wales just in most places that you can go in north wales so no it's a great recommendation i love dartmoor i think that yeah for a beginner to kind of get into bouldering that's a really good tip because i think the thing that puts me off climbing sometimes is it does feel a little bit faffy in terms of like you've got kit and you've got know what to do and it's scary because you're high up a wall but like the bouldering like you say is a lot more accessible yeah you need a lot less stuff and you know there are some i would suggest getting a guidebook or having a little look on ukc so um ukclimbing.com is a website that has a whole load of information about uh routes and boulders and problems and advice and they often have you know top 10 you know bouldering routes for beginners or you know they have some really good articles and inspiration on there as well so um yeah in terms of finding out some places to go just have a little look and because some bouldering areas only have kind of really steep and challenging routes so you might go there and think oh it looks amazing but there's actually nothing you can do because it's all really hard (laughs) (laughs) Um, but there are also loads of places that have loads of really easy entry level routes so it's just about yeah doing that a bit of exploration and investigation before you go oh that sounds like a really good resource and if people have kind of got into climbing they want to take things a bit further with a qualification of some kind what do mountain training offer on the climbing front because i did my um mount my hill walking mountain training with you both well three year guys a few months ago but what about on the climbing front so climbing front there's um quite a few different options depending on whether you're indoors or outdoors okay. so indoors there's um indoor climbing assistant um and so that is for people from age 16 plus um and it's essentially about being a competent person to help and assist uh, a qualified instructor um so that's a great one for people who you know young people who want to get into being an instructor or a coach but they're just a bit too young they're not Mm -hmm. 18 yet so so that's a good place to start also for young people indoors um or outdoors actually is foundation coach so that's a bit more about um not so much teaching people you know about the uh, the equipment side of things it's more how to move well and how right, to be okay. a better climber you know so how do you improve your technique mm-hmm. and how do you yeah you know increase the grade that you can climb at how do you you know just be more efficient in your climbing all that kind yeah. of stuff just the sort of things really that hopefully help keep keep people climbing for a really long time um so yeah so indoor climbing assistant and foundation coach are kind of the two that you can do from 16 and then There's kind of two uh, parallel qualifications. There's climbing wall instructor and rock climbing instructor. Um, So climbing wall for indoors, rock climbing for outdoors. Um, uh, Although rock climbing, with the rock climbing instructor, it does also cover a a bit of indoors. So if you're looking to to do both, then rock climbing instructor is probably the way to go. But if you only want to be instructing indoors, climbing wall instructor. Um, And that really is about teaching you how to how to supervise a group mm-hmm. of people, how to teach them things, how to, you know, teach belaying and also then how to safely manage a group of climbers belaying, you know, because when they don't know what they're doing, you have to put certain mechanisms in place to, you know, obviously yeah. to keep everybody safe. Um <laughs> Uh, so yeah so those two are kind of the next two up uh, and for the rock climbing instructor um that links in quite well with our the higher level rock skills courses that we've got. So I mentioned introduction quite a lot earlier on. We also have uh, in, an intermediate mm-hmm. version of rock skills and also two learn to lead courses. So learn to lead sport climbs and learn to lead trad climbs um, because that's you need to be able to lead routes in order to become a rock yeah. climbing instructor. Um, so we've kind of created a skills course to to give you access into that and then onto the qualifications oh that's really interesting yeah they cut down like great courses something i loved about doing my mountain leader training was that uh, taking away the kind of maybe taking groups out i just felt like you learned so much yourself because i thought i was like fairly competent of mountain and i was like wow i feel a lot safer now that i've done this training yeah absolutely there's there's loads to it you know and all of our providers we've got providers all over the uk for for all of these courses and ireland um so loads of different places to go hopefully somewhere nearish you um in near your climbing wall or you know uh near your nearest crag um but yeah they love it they're super passionate (laughs) people who just want who want you to love it and they want to help you be better um so so yeah so sometimes people get a bit nervous about coming on a training course oh you know am i ready well if you've done the prerequisites that we list clearly on our website then you're ready so just go on the training course you know and you will get a whole load of feedback from that course about things you might need to improve on and think about 
while you're preparing mm-hmm. for assessment. Um, yeah, the training course isn't an assessment. It's a, an opportunity to learn a lot. So that's great to hear that you did learn a whole load more stuff. On yeah, and I definitely course. yeah can like relate to that because I think I at the beginning of the course I was just sort of. I was thinking so much about being on a training course that I forgot about the fact that I've spent hours and hours and days and days outside doing it. And they were like, stop overthinking it. Like, just think about what you'd normally do on a walk to, like, stay safe. And I was like, oh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, exactly. And climbing's the same, you know. So it's just about... um, the only thing that might occasionally be a bit different, and this sometimes mm. happens in the mountains too, is just trying to undo a, um, some bad habits that sometimes yeah. people get into. Um, but that's not that common, to be honest. And it, you know, it's easy to kind of explain and, and show why you might do things in a particular way um, to make sure that it's always, you know, as safe as it can be, and that you're managing the risks. Nice. If this, and if people are interested, like where can they find out more information? What's the next step? Uh, so our website is mountain-training.org. So you can find out everything you need to know there about uh, our rock skills courses and also the climbing qualifications. Uh, and then the other things I've mentioned are NICAS. So if you just Google NICAS, N-I-C-A-S, um, or ukclimbing.com um, is the website that has all the kind of guidebook inspiration things on it. So there you go. You should be an expert climber ready to go on your first or next adventure. Just quickly heading back to the host for a final word. Thank you for sticking with us. That was the climbing episode. Hopefully we've given some of you guys the inspiration to get out there, get on the walls or get on the cliffs, whatever it may be. So before we leave, Tanuke, you said you had a would you rather for us. I do have a would you rather. I'm a little bit worried rather. about this. this. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> right. don't pick it up. Go for it. What we got? <laughs> okay, so would you rather climb to the top of Mount Everest without, an ox- without oxygen Yeah. or kayak through class v rapids which is basically like the most extreme situation i think i've got more much more chance of surviving the everest one do you think without oxygen yeah i mean i'm not saying it'd be easy but kelly and jorna can do it and we're very similar (laughs) (laughs) um yeah i just kelly and jorna the most successful ultra runner of probably in the world right now yeah okay yeah yeah. (laughs) um but i think i just wouldn't even know how to start approaching the rapids yeah like Fair enough. So I, I have that danger. I'd go the other way. I'd go for the kayaking. So I've done whitewater rafting once. So I'm pretty <laughs> sure that makes me an expert. So yeah, I've got that dangerous overconfidence that means, yeah, I think I'll probably do that. Yeah. But actually for me, like altitude has a real effect. Okay. Um, so I've done, uh, when I went to the Jungfrau, um, it was like I really struggled with the altitude and I kind of got this weird vertigo that made mm. me want to jump off things. <gasps> Apparently it's a type of vertigo really? that you get. Yeah, mm. so That's I think I'd eerie. struggle with that, which <laughs> given that I'm, doing Kilimanjaro next year yeah let's see how that goes but you know we'll figure it out what about you which way would you go I think I would do the kayak actually I feel like we can hang out in the kayak yeah yeah th- she that go. will probably last what 10 minutes yeah. but <laughs> that's true it's gonna be a long one and I'm saying this like really cockily like yeah I could get up there but when I did every space camp I got quite bad altitude sickness and wasn't in a great way so oh good luck on that one yeah then. <laughs> well let's see okay so so we worked out what we're gonna do so we, i think in in three episodes we've suggested three very obvious trips that we're looking for our sponsors to take us on so thank you guys <laughs> we'll look forward to those those journeys so thank you for sticking with us for this ep- episode hopefully you found it inspiring and informative a big thank you to yonder for sponsoring us again so don't forget they're giving away the ultimate swim bundle so check out the show notes for how to enter that competition we will see you next week for the next episode Thank you for tuning in to the latest episode of the National Outdoor Pod Show. Like I said at the beginning, please let us know what you're thinking about these episodes, what you want to see next time, and what you want to see in next week. Well, I can let you in for a little secret. We're going to be talking about camping. If you love to camp, then tune in next week. Same place, same time for the next episode of the National Outdoor Pod Show.